everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're excited to be talking to you about Morocco. We'll give people a little bit of a chance to come into the room. You can see on the bottom where the chat is. Let us know where you're calling in from. We'd love to hear from you. We've got Christina Vaughn here, who's helping us out on the technical side. So during the slideshow, if you have questions, you can feel free and type them in there. And then we'll also have some time at the end for questions. So we will be able to cover it all. We'll probably be answering lots of questions as we go along. Katie, that's awesome. Thanks for joining us for, from Denver. I lived there for a short minute, long time ago. I absolutely loved it. The mountains are so, so beautiful. Anyone else? Where are you calling in from? All right. Well, oh, Teresa, Austin. Actually, Adil here is in Austin as well, and I used to live there, so we have lots of connections with Austin. Great city. Probably still quite warm right now, being summertime, um, but love it. The roots of Traverse are also in Austin. So we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Ashley. I'm the founder of Traverse, and we have with us Adil. I'll let you introduce yourself, Adil, who's our local guide and our operating partner. Adil, you want to give a little intro for yourself? Yeah, um, uh, good to be here and happy to answer um, everybody's questions. My name is Adil, born and raised in the southern part of Morocco, um, also known as the Great Sahara Desert. Um, lived with my family as a nomad up until I was seven years old. Uh, then we moved into a village structure type of um, housing. Um, the lifestyle of nomadic people dictates that you have to know the topography of the Sahara, the animals that live in there, how to live and how to navigate the entire land. Um, I grew up um, mostly in the desert and then I had my university um, learning or degree in Marrakesh. Um, I've traveled quite a bit all over Morocco, other uh, African countries, but um, it, it's a passion of mine to show people uh, the beautiful country of Morocco, the landscape, the people, the language, the, um, the colors, the spices, and everything are super inviting. And I think Morocco is the um, best country to be uh, a great introduction for uh, the, the continent of Africa. Absolutely, thank you. So, and we've been working uh, Traverse with Adil for a long time, We uh, since I think 2018. So we've done lots and lots of trips in Morocco. And just to let you know a little bit more about Traverse. So we're really all about people. Like in Morocco, this really comes through with hospitality and people to people interactions. You know, we protect the planet. We do everything we can for like plastic waste reduction and sustainability. And we travel with meaning. So it's transformative for you. It has impact on local economies. It's um, all part of like the mechanism and the uh, ecology of sustainable travel. So we'll go ahead and get started talking about Morocco. Um, Adil, can you tell us a little bit about the basics, about the geography, about the climate? Um, the country itself, so, so the name Morocco, um, let's say is, is what everybody else would refer to the country when it comes to like Europe or the Western world. But in Arabic, Morocco is called Al-Maghrib, which in Arabic translates to the furthest Arabian country to the West. So if you put uh, the, uh, uh, if you look at the Arabian, uh, you know, uh, countries maps, then you would see that Morocco is actually on the furthest West uh, that sits it on a very uh, crucial and important geographical location because we're only 14 kilometers away from uh Spain and eventually the, uh, the continent of, of Europe. Um, there's parts of Morocco where you could actually be having a cup of coffee and looking at the um, Spanish coast from Tangier. Um, the climate is uh, it's, it's very diverse because if you go to northern Morocco, then it is a little bit um, cooler. Uh, it rains there a lot. But once you cross what's called the High Atlas Mountain, than you are in this very uh, dry and arid uh, type of uh, climate, which changes the topography. So now you're into more, uh, you know, desertic landscape. There, there are parts of Morocco where if you're traveling, you feel like you're in a totally different country almost every two hours. 
um, and you uh, see that not only within the landscape, but you also see that on um, people's faces, uh, the, uh, the pigmentations, the, uh, the the way they dress. We have more than 67 tribes in the entire country. The country itself is about 12 centuries old. It has been influenced by so many civilizations. The Cartesians, the, Roman, the, the Romans were there, the Phoenicians, and then, um, of course, the Amazigh or the Berber people are indigenous before all that, but they were also influenced by the arrival of Arabs in the uh, 7th century. So that creates this very um, interesting melange of, of uh, culture and uh, also topography. So Morocco is very interesting when it comes to, you know, um, wanting to discover either the Arab world or the African continent. It, it, it's, it's a great place to, to start. Yeah, and like um, one of the things that I love as a traveler and we really talk about a lot in Traverse is like culture. And when we're talking about culture and values in Morocco, one of the big ones that you'll see from the beginning is relationship. So we talk about in kind of like the theoretical world, this idea of collectivist culture, which is thinking in terms of we rather than me, very sociable, concert, like conversational, a lot of oral traditions. Like you can see in like the old days and it's a little bit still like in Marrakesh, there were the storytellers in the Medina, you know, like, and they capture all of this history through these like oral repeated stories. So that's a very like big part of the culture. And you'll also see um, important pieces like hospitality, like making a good impression, having a positive inner image, like giving you a cup of tea. Um, there are some kind of, if you get deeper into culture, ideas of like saving face. Um, Adil, you can pronounce this word for me. Uh, or exactly. that's, that's the, the duty to the family, which, which is, I think it, it comes first. And then um, the, the shuma, which is the uh, equivalent to saving face. So there, there are these values that are uh, really embedded within the Moroccan culture. Uh, so, uh, when, when people are doing something, there's always a regard towards, uh, society in general. And, and you see that in so many aspects of life. Um, so if, if you reflect on, uh, let's say the three meals that everybody, um, um, you know, gathers around, uh, to, to have Moroccan people would often have. A, a big plate that could serve uh, six to seven uh, people at once. And, and so you're all sharing this one meal taken, you know, part into this, this ceremony. And the same thing when it comes to tea. A, a great example is the picture in front of us. Uh, that is me sitting with my cousin who still lives as a nomad in the Sahara Desert. And he's preparing tea for our uh, Traverse guests. Um, the, the tea ceremony, um, everybody that you see is actually invited into that tea ceremony. It takes, it takes a, a little bit longer. You share glasses of tea. Uh, there's three glasses. The first one is usually to break the ice. The second one is to really get to know, to, to know the person is, and the third one is to, um, you know, see if you want to invite them again back into your house or not. So, um, Everything that is, you know, within the Moroccan culture is, is within regards to, you know, a, 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 coll a collective um, aspect of life. So we use the term we much more than we use the term I. Um, and, and that is a, a, you know, a, a blueprint for the entire Moroccan society. Yeah, exactly. And another piece of um, Moroccan culture that you'll really see is this idea of flexibility. And you can think of like, if you think of environmental, like how the environment impacts the culture, you can think of how ways of doing things, like there's this kind of short term focus. If you think of like weather changing and whatnot, you have to take care of what's in front of you. So you can kind of look back at the history of how 
cultures develop. Um, but you'll notice that in day-to-day -day things like language and conversation, for example, you might move from one subject to another. It's kind of fluid. And you'll also notice, you know, Morocco geographically, like Adil was saying, is has this relationship with other countries and cultures, right? It's like up to Europe. So it's got that. It's down to sub-Sahara Africa. So it has a completely different, like, relationship to Africa it has like the Arab influence so you can see how it's it's this like very flexible fluid culture and so you'll notice that uh, as you're experiencing the country as well the, so uh, do you want to say anything else about that Adil? What's that? oh just if you wanted to say anything else about the culture um, no, it was just really interesting the, the flexibility um, it, it's something that is actually shared amongst all those tribes. Like there's, so every single tribe that lived or still live in Morocco has of course a very uh, special, you know, uh, social tissue that, that makes it a little recognized than other tribes, but they all share that trait when it comes to flexibility. You know, uh, you could be from the North, but then if you interact with another uh, tribe from the South, they all uh, will be uh, flexible when it comes to language. So they may speak a different dialect, with, which in the entire country we have more than 27 dialects. Uh, some of them are Arabic, some of them are Berber, some of them are uh, influenced by Spanish or French. And then the more you move towards the south, those will be influenced also by sub-Saharan um, dialects. But they, people will always be flexible and with um, get out of their way to, you know, accommodate the linguistic difficulties of, of other people. So flexibility is a very um, embedded thing also in, in the Moroccan culture. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. So we'd love to like take you on a little trip. So we'll sh show you kind of what we do on the itinerary. There are some things that like very typically you might do in Morocco. There are a, a lot of other things where we take you on like some really special like hidden gems. So we'll just kind of take you on our route. You can see on this map here, the loop that we make for the Southern Moroccan part into the Sahara Desert, which Adil will talk more about in detail. Um, and we also include Marrakesh. We do it as well so that there's after the Marrakesh and Sahara Desert part an add on to Fez and Shashawan. And the reason we split it up like that is because we know, you know, Americans are, our vacation tends to be limited. So it gives you a little bit of that flexibility. You know, if you can only have the time for Marrakesh and the Sahara, or if you have the extra time, highly, highly recommend Fez and Shafshawan. And as the deal was saying, like Morocco is so colorful and different areas of Morocco have different colors. So you'll see these like ochre reds in Marrakesh in the South. You'll see this like, really bright blue and chef Shawan and then like Fez is its own world it really is like going back in time so something that I love about that and then we have these experiences where we stay at local riads and different types of accommodations which we'll talk more about Morocco is very seasonal when it comes to food you know we get uh, used to in, in the states of like having something different like every meal right like we might have I don't know, like a delicious smoothie in the morning. And then like, we'll have like a, a salad with some hummus for lunch. And then we'll have like sushi takeout in the evening. I mean, we like go around the world with our food. In Morocco, it's quite different because we're talking about like, you know, pumpkins grow in the fall. And so you have like pumpkin everything, soup and you have it in your tagines and you know, you're know you going with what's local and seasonal. So it's a little bit of a different approach. Sometimes for travelers, that's hard to like wrap your head around. You're like another tagine, but that's what's, you know, available and local and we're using delicious local vegetables. Um, we'll talk more about like the souks and shopping in those, the hammam experience, which is a must. That's the, the Arab style, Moroccan style um, spa. And then like out in the desert in the Sahara, we get glamping, meaning you actually have like some toilets to use. You have a tent to sleep under. Uh, one of our favorite things is we always have a community partner in our trips that's a nonprofit. We visit a Berber women's um, co-op that makes rugs from literally like the lamb's wool to the rug. Uh, and in our particular experience, we also include daily yoga. And no, no worries. If you don't do yoga, you don't have to do it. You can still have all of the rest of the experience, but it's really magical to do it in the desert, in the sand, get all that stretching in. This is kind of what it looks like um, in Marrakesh on the terrace. Uh, so yeah. So let's talk a little bit about types of accommodations. Um, Adil, can you tell us kind of like the difference between these? Yeah. 
So because of the uh, diversity when it comes to landscape and, and climate with on the Moroccan uh, uh, topography, then often you would see that buildings are not, or, or structure, structural buildings are not all the same. Um, they most of the times will be built out of uh, clay. So in uh, Marrakesh, Fas, or uh, all the imperial cities, which means these cities were at some point capital to, to Morocco, according to what dynasty used to rule. So if you go to Marrakesh, then you'd find what's called a Riyadh. And, and um, a Riyadh is an Arabic word, and it translate to um, a light breeze. Um, a Riyadh is an open structure from the inside. Um, it, it's an open uh, courtyard. It's uh, made out of clay. Usually it would have two to three stories uh, with uh, up to 15 uh, rooms. A Riyadh is shared among either one or two families. Um, so uh, you would find a fountain right in the middle of a Riyadh. Uh, the, the structure of the Riyadh is made because um, it gets sometimes hot in Marrakesh, especially during the summertime. So uh, think of that um, hot air, you know, traveling above the house, and then it, it goes down through the open courtyard, and it's around the uh, fountain, so it gets, cools off. Um, and then now suddenly, if you open your door, you go inside the Riyadh, you definitely feel like a, it's like a garden. So it feels um, light and breezy. So that's what the name comes from. Um, Riyadhs typically um, are very close to each other. In the Medina, which is the old town of every uh, Moroccan city, um, Riyadhs are within these small alleyways, and it looks like a, a maze. And so if you come upon a, a small alley, then you see a lot of doors that may look all the same. But once you open that door, you go inside, then you find um, an entire house in a Riyadh, uh, usually covered with mosaic or tiles and um, other uh, Moroccan uh, beautiful colors. All Riyadhs in Marrakesh or all houses in Marrakesh are painted the same uh, red earthy color because the south is made out of that, um, you know, mud and, and clay. So they try to, uh, it, it's actually a policy in Marrakesh that if you build a new house, you have to paint it in that color. So it, it uh, claims uh, unity um, and, uh, you know, an original uh, link to what, what houses used to look like back in the day. Now, if you go to the Kasbahs, when you move, away from Marrakesh and you cross the High Atlas Mountains, then you come upon these big earthy structures that looks like palaces. Um, if any of you guys is familiar with uh, Games of Thrones, the um, there, there's a very famous scene that was uh, filmed in Morocco in, in a, a village called Kasbah Eid Ben Hadou. It's a, it's a, a very famous movie set. Um, so a Kasbah is a fortified palace that has four towers, and it's entirely made, made out of clay. It could accommodate up to uh, 37, up to 40 also uh, people. So you could find one or four families in one Kasbah. Um, it's uh, it's a, a very beautiful scenery because usually Kasbahs are on top of a hill or a mountain. Um, and back in the day, if you're traveling on uh, a caravan, camel caravan, then you have to stop by these customers, either to pay taxes or to, you know, get supplies before you go to the next uh, destination. Um, glamping is what we do in the Sahara Desert. So as nomads, we uh, typically use uh, tents. Our tents would be very minimal, but when um, tourism got really popular in Morocco and people started visiting uh, the country, um, we needed to accommodate, you know, certain uh, needs. So um, within um, the camp, you would find one uh, communal big tent, which would serve as a restaurant. So we would have uh, meals in there. 
um, you would also find a permanent structure of um, um, bathrooms with uh, toilet seats, um, hot showers, and then you would find the uh, the, the tents that could be uh, either you know double uh, occupancy or single or for a family, and then this structure is surrounded by the the golden dunes. So if you uh, get out of your your tent and climb one of those dunes, you everything you will see is just endless um, oceans of of, uh, of sand dunes. So these are uh, three of of the most common uh, structure building structures that are in Morocco: the Riyadh, the Kasbahs, and of course the the, the tents. Yeah, exactly. And you can see some of those, the pictures of the different styles um, going back here. So we have like these are examples of uh, Riyadh and Marrakesh uh, and then the Kaspas out in the like outside of the city. And then what we stay in when we do the Sahara Desert portion. And you can see we're all doing yoga on the beautiful carpets there as well. It's really magical. Um, so coming kind of back to Marrakesh, like the souk. So uh, as Adil said, like the Medina is the old village or old center of the village. And, you know, the souk experience is really unique because there's so many artists and crafts. You know, it used to be that's where you would go to shop. I mean, still people do today. I remember like I the first time I went to Morocco, I was like, why? And, and I've been going back there for years and years um, but I was like, why are there like 10, you know, shoe vendors all together, you know, and uh, coming from more of like an American mindset where like, okay, you go to the store tar target or whatever. But what, what it is, is, is going back to that relationships, like we were talking about, like the culture piece, you know, you make relationships with the different vendors, and then they take care of you. And so that's one of the big draws of the souk, you know, there might be 20 vendors selling the same spices but each vendor is gonna have their special, special connection to where they come from, and then they're gonna have their special customer, uh, connection to their customers and how they take care of those people. So Adil, you wanna talk a little bit more about the souk? Yeah, so uh, souk is also an uh, Arabic word, and it means uh, simply market. So if you hear the souks, it's going to be in the, uh, the old Medinas, of course. Now, these souks usually are in the back um, of of the Medina, uh, reason why they're in the back of the of the Medina uh, is that um, the tanneries are also put in the back of the Medina because they're a little bit smelly. So um, in order not to you know hold the the, the leather for uh, uh, you know a long distance, then they the leather is usually processed closer to where the soups are. When you go to the soups again, it's within this big, amazing, and fabulous maze of the Medina, um, it, it's uh, it's not very hard to, to find where the souks are because um, each area of the souk or the market has a certain commodity that is being sold in there. So there's the spice market, um, and it's literally uh, like a, a big yard where you could find probably 30 to, to, to 40 um, hanuts, as we say. That's the word for a shop. Um, that sells spices. And as Ashley said, um, they may look like they're a little bit the same or selling almost the same thing, but each one of them have their own, let's say, uh, mix of spices, their own way of grinding spices. And uh, when you go to a spice shop, it's not, it's, it's almost also like going to pharmacy because that is the first thing that um, a Moroccan would do if they get any symptoms of, let's say, cold or a rash or um, any illness, they would first go to the spice shop and get the remedies also or spices. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then they would go to a regular pharmacy for uh, drugs. And then um, the other parts of the soup, then you would find leather work, you could find um, uh, silver, you could find uh, woodwork. So Typically, when you go to the souk, um, it, it would probably take you half a day, if not an entire day. Um, each corner of the souk has something that is being sold. And what I like to tell uh, uh, our guests when I'm leading the, uh, the souk tour usually is um, it's a good indication. If you come upon one alleyway and everybody's selling the same thing, that means that the quality is going to be good. 
because there's competition and also the prices are going to be better. But if you are somewhere um, where you can find a shoe place next to a spice place next to a brass uh, shop, then uh, usually those are very close to uh, tourist attractions, maybe an old palace or the, uh, the big square Marrakesh, for example. Those prices are going to be a little bit more expensive and the quality is not all good. But that's why I will be with you guys to show you um, the best places to go and, and shop and what's what's good quality and what's not. So the, the souks of Marrakesh actually entered the uh, UNESCO's uh, World Heritage uh, list because there's so much um, uh, there's so much uh, uh, traditions and, and uh, history that is still held um, in, 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 in the souks and the best way to get to know the locals is actually to go to the souks. Uh, there's uh, not only uh, shops in the souks, but there's also restaurants where you could eat. There's uh, places where you could have uh, uh, coffee, tea, uh, a glass of wine. Um, it's a it's a really beautiful area to uh, to, to see the Moroccan culture uh, at, at its finest. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so then we take so for in terms of our itinerary, so we go across the Atlas Mountains. Afterward, we spend some time in Marrakesh, and we also spend some time on the back end. Um, and it's a really, really incredible drive. This is Eight Ben Hadou, which uh, Adil had just mentioned um, about when we were talking about the Kasbah housing and the caravans. And this is a UNESCO site. It is absolutely incredible. And this is a good example of like desert scenery and architecture kind of all blending in together. Oops. Um, and once you get in and up close, you can see this is one of our, this is our group from 2020, right before COVID hit. That was an adventure. Um, and you can see the architecture here. It's really incredible to explore and see how the old buildings are, are made. And the artwork, there's some really specific types of artwork that date back historically. I won't give it all away because you can discover it when you're there, but there's like kind of some secrets to their artwork and uh, how it was used for messaging back in the past, back in the day. And it's really cool to see artisans still protecting those. So once we cross the Atlas Mountains and get into the Sahara Desert, as Adil was saying, like this is where those like endless sands, they are just so, so beautiful. So we drive across those. We have incredible drivers along with us and our four by fours. This is what the crew looks like. Uh, Adil's there as well. Um, and, you know, it takes a lot of skill to drive across that, uh, that kind of terrain. So definitely hands down to them for taking good care of us. And those four by fours are really fun. And um, Adil, do you want to talk a little bit about camels? Because I know some people, like, it can be a little controversial, but it's also very, very important to Moroccan culture. And you, as you've talked about growing up, you know, this is something that was, like, part of your childhood. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, so, so camels are to, to, uh, to, to nomads or to, to Moroccans in the southern part of, uh, of the country are very, very sacred. And because of that, they're uh, treated like, um, I remember my, uh, my grandpa um, would, would always say that his camels are the uh, same as his sons. Because, um, and he would also say, camels are what brought us here. Because when we talk about Arabs coming into, um, you know, the, the, that part of the, of the country in the seventh century, now, uh, keep in mind that back then there's no, you know, transportation. There's it, it's really hard to like navigate. Also, when it comes to the Sahara Desert, so if it wasn't for camels, it, it, like a lot of human progress at that part of the world would not be happening. So these are creatures that are actually designed for the Sahara Desert. Uh, they can go up to uh, three weeks without a single drop of water, which is mind blowing uh, for or, uh, you know, a creature that size. They can handle the heat, they can handle the sandstorm and all the other, you know, harsh terrains. Um, camels are treated really good because we believe that if you treat them really good, they're going to also treat you um, 
really good. There's this very uh, sacred relationship between humans and camels in, in the Sahara, because it, it's uh, it's as simple as to think that camels cannot get into the water inside the well, but it takes a human to draw the uh, the, the bucket so to, to water the camels. But then also humans cannot travel for vast distance at a time if it wasn't for camels. So there's this cohabitation between camels and, and humans at that part of the world, and, and therefore we, we treat them good, and they treat us good. And so um, I, I grew up with, um, you know, camels most of my life, um, and, and that's one thing that I miss in Austin. There's, there's no camel. <laughs> but yeah. For us, um, camels are, uh, are something that um, poetry, uh, you know, there, there's plenty of songs and, and romantic uh, stories that are made around camels. And, and you could imagine um, that uh, if it wasn't for these animals, then um, a, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, aspects of nowadays life, as we know it, at that part of the world would not be actually uh, present. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a really beautiful experience and like being out in the sand and, you know, on this creature that is just like made for it is really actually very special. Um, so here are a few more pictures of what it looks like in the desert. And as we said, we do yoga, like the evenings are just absolutely incredible. Like that desert sunset, we have music. This is another one of uh, Adil's cousins. And um, so this was like a random encounter actually last time we were there because they happened to be in the area because we're talking about nomadic nomadic peoples. Um, so that's a really special experience. Um, she made us sand bread, which is something that you'll get to learn about, uh, baking bread in the hot sand. Um, and then another one of our, you know, I mentioned that like people is such a central part of our trips and we always have a nonprofit community partner. So we stop at a Berber Women's Textile Co-op you can see here all of the yarns that are um, made from natural dyes, which come from plants like indigo and saffron. And um, it's all from like beginning to end. And like these women, um, they, you know, you, like it's really amazing to be able to communicate, not using the same language, but still being able to communicate and to see like how the yarn is made itself, how it's like created into textiles and how like all of these designs, like you can see on the right, like that is like a, one woman's like imagination. Like they have meaning, These they have symbolism in it. It's infused with like upbringing and tradition in the community. And the best part is in this particular case, like um, with these like 90% of the revenue, I think it is 90% is going directly to that woman and that supporting that community. When you're buying rugs from, you know, Fez or Marrakesh, whatever, like there's middlemen involved. So much less money is going to the, the person that made it and the, the community that supported it. So Adil, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so I, um, I've always been fascinated by, um, as you said, this, this process of, um, making such a beautiful um, creation out of something simple as, as just uh, yarn or uh, sheep wool. Um, what really blows my mind is that um, these ladies have never went to school, never had an art class, yet they can come up with a, a design on a, a rug or a, a carpet that took uh, four to six months um, that it, it really looks like a mess. Um, this is something that um, also, uh, you know, uh, give an imprint or a, a very distinguished uh, layer to one tribe um, from another, because each tribe has their own way of making rugs. Now, when it comes to um, buying these rugs, all of them are made uh, either in the uh, Ansi or Mid or High Atlas Mountains or the Sahara Desert. But most of them are being sold in Marrakesh or Fes or the big city. So as Ashley emphasized, there's a lot of middlemen in between this process. So very little money goes back to the actual person that made this rug. So when we um, do our tours, we try to uh, open people's eyes on um, these beautiful things and when or where they, they, they come from. So we take people to the Berber co-ops. They're always very happy to see us. 
they uh, would make tea. You can uh, uh, talk to the ladies. They would also show you how to do little techniques when it comes to uh, weaving the, the rugs. You will see the process from the beginning to an end. And they have a beautiful gallery where you can uh, get your rugs. They have uh, the, uh, the shipping uh, option. Uh, they also take credit cards and, and all that because the government helped them a little bit so that these traditions would stay, um, you know, alive. It's very funny, but when you try to swipe a, a credit card, then usually they take the, uh, the little machine and they would go up on the roof to try to catch the signal. But this tells you how remote um, th these villages are. And it, so if it wasn't for um, people coming to them, uh, the rest of the world would not know that these beautiful rugs are actually coming from this uh, small village. Yeah. Yeah. And also on Traverse Trips, we have a donation component to our community partners. And I mean, you can buy a rug or not. There's absolutely no ob obligation to you when you're visiting, but we, but know that if you join a Traverse Trip um, for the group trips, like a donation goes directly to the community partner and that helps them again, preserving these traditions, education in the village, like all kinds of different community projects. So that's something, a way that we like to give back on our travels. So let's shift over and I want to, I'll be mindful of the time. I know we're trying to keep it to like 30, 45 minutes. Always hard to do when we're talking about Morocco. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about the food. So I mentioned like seasonality. You can see these amazing lemons. Citrus is incredible. So just kind of a little overview of things that you'll see a lot. So tagines are both the dish itself cooked in a clay pot. Um, and the the pot itself so you can see like on the bottom left you've got these like meat and vegetable dishes that are like very slow cooked and that's like very very common to find throughout chicken lamb or vegetarian uh, it is a very bread based culture I'll talk about some dietary restrictions in a minute but you'll see like bread is life and you've got couscous which is handmade hand rolled absolutely amazing soups according to season I absolutely love pumpkin soup and Morocco is my favorite. I love pumpkin soup anyway, but in Morocco, it's so amazing because it's got these spices in it. You'll see a lot of lentil soups, often like for starters, that kind of thing. Um, seasonal fruits, uh, you've got orange season, you've got pomegranates, you've got dates, so you have figs, and then you'll see lots of different seasonal vegetables like zucchini, tomatoes, the pumpkin and squash, eggplants, peppers. So when it comes to dietary restrictions, it's actually very easy to be vegan or vegetarian there. You've got quality protein sources like lentils and chickpeas. Um, Gluten-free is harder in the sense that like bread is everywhere. So if you're very sensitive, cross-contamination is something to be aware of. But it's, in terms of finding like carbohydrate replacements, it's very easy to find rice and potatoes. Um, and then anywhere and everywhere you go, you'll have the iconic Moroccan mint tea, which is um, like gunpowder green tea with mint, a specific variety of mint that is just absolutely so amazing. We'll also teach you how to say no sugar if you don't like super sweet, because it is very, very sweet, uh, but it is delicious. Uh, Adil, what's your favorite Moroccan food? Uh, that's that's a really hard question. I, I can't really, but the safest, I think the safest answer is um, tagine because you could kick, cook anything you want in a in a tagine. You could you could make Berber omelets and it's as as simple as uh, tomatoes and, and eggs. Uh, but I really love couscous. The way it's like every time I go back <clears throat> home, my mother would make this seven hours long uh, couscous meal, and it's it, it, it's really hard to like resist that because so I, I would probably put couscous um number one so yes couscous yeah yeah absolutely and um you'll see that there's all kinds of different uh, influences you know you've got some french influence in the food with like some of the cheeses you've got of course all the arab influence you've got like what's native you also have one of my favorite things is like the flower waters like orange blossom water or rose water like these really delicate infused flavors um, and then, of course, like the tradition of how you have the food itself, you can see like on a rooftop with a beautiful view, you know, back to that community value. So it's very much something that you do together, uh, having breakfast together. So these are all like just kind of the ways that you eat and commune together, you know, take a long time, have great conversations. It's just like one of this is like as we're driving across the Atlas Mountains, you know, might take a long time for your food, but it's worth the wait. So 
that is something we love. I'm going to do a quick overview of uh, Fez and Shashawan and what we what we do there, and then we'll open up it up for some questions because I'm sure you have them. So if you know the portion that we're talking about right now is Marrakesh in the south into the Sahara Desert. If you have the time, highly recommend going up to Fez. Fez is like the heartbeat of this like really ancient culture. There's like very ancient like education tradition, ta uh, tannery traditions there. The, the tile work that they do, wood carving, copper, like artisan, the um, Medina itself is this absolute labyrinth, like very, very complicated to get around, but also super historical. And as Adil was saying, like you might see a door and you have no idea what's in it and you go through the door and you're like in another world. It's really incredible. And then um, these are some kind of images of like Fez, the very, very ornate um, mosaics that you'll see the tanneries where they dye leather. Um, this is from our accommodations in Fez, which we absolutely love. Everyone who takes care of you, it's a very, very beautiful, like four-star Riyadh. The ar architecture is incredible. The hospitality and friendliness, it's just like absolutely amazing. Um, you can see some kind of images of like the inside, what it looks like. Um, you can see how absolutely beautiful it is. So, and then heading on for a drive, it's a couple of hours to Chef Shawan, which is also known as the Blue Pearl. So you can see, as we we're kind of saying, like the colors change, like as you go through through Morocco. And Chef Shawan is just like this really little but charming place. You can wander through the streets. You won't get as lost as you will in spring. So I went too fast there. But that's where we take you. So if you add the, um, if you do the add-on, you go to Fez by train, you, um, we have a driver take you to Shoshawan and then you depart from Tangier. So um, I, we'll, I see a question about transportation and I'll um, get, to you, get to that in a minute. So just a couple of travel tips. Um, in terms of like when to go, spring and fall is what we tend toward because of course it's quite hot in the summer. You absolutely can travel in the winter. There is some snow in the mountains, you know, for in terms of like driving, but people do go like over Christmas time, for example. Um, you know, for clothing, it is a more conservative culture. And so in, in terms of respecting culture, we have some really great blogs that I can send as follow up on like female and clothing, you know, like uh, covering your shoulders if you're going into mosques. Generally speaking, you know, like, I mean, if you're out doing yoga with a group, you can wear your like yoga shorts, that's fine. But if you're out and about in the city, like just being mindful of respect, you know, what kind of the cultural expectations are. And then as far as like street smarts, very, I mean, by and large, as like I've traveled solo in Morocco quite a lot as a female, I feel very safe and comfortable there using street smarts, right? Like being aware of, you know, dark alleys or going out alone. There is kind of some like phone snatching that can happen or like that type of petty, petty crime in like the busy streets, especially. So just uh, being aware, I think I would give it a pretty typical level of, uh, of street smarts. Cash is still widely used. Um, there, you know, when you get into larger establishments like hotels or restaurants that are bigger, they will usually take a credit card. Um, and as far as like ethical travel, you know, a lot of that surrounds around photography and taking pictures and like being aware of children or who has like the power in that photo op. Like if, if you have someone that like with the Berber women, when we're, you know, in watching and engaging with them, there's like, and we have that kind of like uh, indicated permission, that's one thing. But if you're just out on the street and taking a picture of a random person, either you'll be expected to have money or just has this like kind of inappropriate vibe and feel. So those are some top tips. Adil, do you have any other travel tips you want to add? Um, no, I, I think that really uh, sums it up. Um, the um, the travel in Morocco is, is super safe and I will... Um, uh, I cannot emphasize uh, that enough. Um, it is um, one of the safest, if not the safest, country to, to travel to in in Africa. Um, it, it is with uh, um, you know traveling could be a little tricky when it comes to uh, you know like navigating your way around, and that's why we always try to go uh, with with locals uh, from from that area. So if you're in Fez. Um, there's a there's a local guide. If you're in Marrakesh, there's a local guide. Obviously, when you're in the Sahara, you have somebody who's uh, born and raised in there. But um, uh, yeah, it's it's super safe. Um, there's um, ATMs everywhere. There's uh, 
you know, uh, if you uh, get lost somewhere, then people are more than happy to help you get to, you know, your Riyadh or, or your hotel. Yeah, absolutely. And Ina, which is so great to see you on the call. Ina is traveling with us later this year. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> I said, Hi. Um, so in terms of exchanging money, you know, if you have euros that you want to use, there are places that you can go exchange for the local currency. Another way you can do it, though, is just like use up your euros when you're in the eurozone and get new money um, from an ATM in Moroccan euro. So that's what that's probably what I would recommend. I don't I think it's always a good idea when you're traveling to have a little extra stash of either euros or US dollars, because if something does happen, your ATM card isn't working, whatever, and you're in a pinch. Those two currencies are always good, even if it's just like 20, 40 something that you have is always a good idea. So thank you. Um, and then like what I was saying about kind of female travel, you know, considering gender norms, dressing appropriately, time and place matters. You know, something that's key that I've learned, like being kind, but not too friendly. So because it can come across not as you intend, put it that way. So, you know, that's one good tip that I've learned in like my travels. Um, and also not being afraid to uh, to speak up. Like there's a great phrase, la shukran, which is no thank you, um, which is I found, find very helpful to just like deflect and be able to move on. Um, so, okay, so that kind of wraps up. And I see that we have another question, which I'll absolutely get to here in just a minute. Um, so just to kind of wrap up the discussion about Morocco and let you know what's coming up. Uh, we do have some discounts for you. We have a little bit of a last minute discounts. If you can join us in September, we would love to have you. We also have next year's trips up. So February and September next year. You can also do um, self-guided at really any time. So I'll be sending a follow-up email with this as well. So you don't have to uh, uh, memorize it. And we have lots more live events coming up. So keep an eye out for notifications for those. So um, okay, so now to answer questions. Elizabeth, yes, absolutely. We have, this is being recorded. So after we're done, we'll be downloading the video and sending it out. So you'll be able to listen to the first part. Um, Ellen, you asked about sending purchases home, what your options are. Um, Adil, do you want to answer that? Because it kind of depends on what you're buying from whom. Sure. Um, so most, uh, almost everything that you buy, let's say in the souks or anywhere in Morocco, could be uh, sent back home. Um, I would say 95% of the time, the uh, vendor that uh, sold you that commodity um, will even include the, sh the shipping within that. So if you buy a rug from the co-op, let's say, they will definitely uh, be sending it uh, to you back home if you want that option. If you buy spices, you could bring those with you also on the, on the airplane. Um, uh, but absolutely, there's... there's uh, DHL facilities in Marrakesh and other uh, cities if you want to do that on your own also. But uh, uh, send them things back home if there's no problem uh, in, in that regard. Yeah, and I always recommend, you know, pack a little lighter, leave some extra room in your suitcase. Um, you know, especially if you know you want something specific that you can even use while you're there, like a scarf, for, for example. Um, and you asked about uh, infrastructure regarding transportation. Maybe if you could clarify your question, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it. You know, when we're in the country, we have private drivers, like when we go out to the Sahara Desert or when we take you from like Shashan to Tangier or your airport transfers. When you're in town, there's like, if you do something on your own, there's taxi options. Um, in some cases, like going from Marrakesh to Fez, there's a train. So, um, it's really nice. It's like seven hours, but it's really beautiful. You get to see the landscape. It's chill. It's like very, very nice and comfortable. Um, I, I don't know which types of careers do students find themselves gravitating for. Adil, do you have an answer for that? Um, Moroccans in general are, um, really drawn to, uh, you know, a lot of, nowadays, a lot of tech. I I, I know a few Moroccans that are in, like, Harvard now, uh, but it's, it's really across the board when it comes to uh, students and career and uh, what do they want to, to do. But there's a, a variety of, um, uh, you know, uh, fields. Uh, right now, what's really um, is popular back home is, um, uh, clean energy. 
Morocco has this uh, project of uh, what is going to be later on, probably within 2030, uh, the uh, uh, biggest or the largest uh, solar farm in the world. And um, it's very close to the city of Wazazet. And so there's a lot of students that are right now uh, enrolled within um, that, uh, you know, uh, curriculum to, to be their engineers or technicians. But um, it, it's really across the boards. Like there's not like one career that Moroccan students would, would uh, go after. There's uh, there's uh, tech, medicine. There's you know all all sorts of uh, careers. Most of the uh, universities in Morocco are uh, for free. Uh, there's also private universities. Of course, people would always try to uh, seek higher and better quality of education. So often you would either find them applying for a university either in the States or mostly in Europe because of uh, distance. So we have a lot of Moroccans that uh, go to, let's say, France or uh, Germany to do their university studies or, uh, you know, uh, PhD. And then they would come back to their home or stay there and, and start uh, a career. Awesome. Um, let's see here. I'm... Um... Ina, I'm going to answer yours in a minute. Uh, Elizabeth, you asked about best time to avoid sandstorms in the desert. I've been in a sandstorm in the desert or two. I don't know. Is there a best time, Adil? It's, so it's it's quite unpredictable nowadays because of, of climate change, honestly. But um, uh, usually the, the, the time that we travel, so September, let's say September, October, and November is, is a great time. If you come around, let's say, um, uh, March, April, and, and, and that's when it's, you know, when it, it's changing to be a little hot, then that is what uh, caused the, the sandstorms. Any sandstorm that is going to randomly happen uh, uh, outside of the hot months, which is uh, June, Jul May, June, July, and uh, August, um, are going to be very minimal, meaning that they will Probably, if they happen, that they would last for maybe one to two hours, maybe three hours. But um, the ones that happen during the summertime, those are the ones that would last for half a day, a day, maybe two days. But um, again, the, the structure of the, the camp that we have, if there's a sandstorm that happens, then we are inside the, you know, the, the tents. Um, People usually would gather in the big communal tent where the restaurant is, and we would be uh, playing some kind of a game, and then the sandstorm would end. So um, uh, I don't, I don't think any very severe sandstorms uh, will will affect uh, the months of um, October or November. Yeah, yeah, and they pass relatively quickly um, as well. So. <laughs> Um, you know, you asked about private transit. So when we set up private transit, they're very professional. They're very much on time. You have their contact number. You can reach them on WhatsApp. Like kind of everyone knows whatever, what's going on. So we haven't had issues with that at all in the past. Um, and then as far as like other tours, like day tours from Viator, Airbnb, TripAdvisor, I mean, I would assume that it's like relative local people. I don't know, Adil, what, what's your experience with those? Um, experience with uh, the Dina was asking tours. about like day tours that you might find on Airbnb or via tour. Like, is it locals that are doing that? Is it a big company that's doing it? Do you know? Um, mostly it's going to be locals, but uh, the thing is that you have to be a little careful with uh, is it um, an official guide or not an official guide? Because if it's an official guide, then it means they went through a, a, you know a training to how handle certain situations if they happen and whatnot. Uh, if it's not an official guide, then, um, you know, it's just somebody else showing you the the, uh, the, the country. Uh, I myself had to go through, you know, several exams to obtain the, the official guide license. Um, and there's thousands of people that apply almost every uh, four years and uh, almost 10% of them that get um, you know the, the the card or the the license. So the the government or the Ministry of Tourism would uh, usually make these laps all around touristic areas to make sure that foreigners are or tourists are um, in good hands when it comes to 
local guides. If you find anything or uh, on Airbnb, then I would recommend reading their bio and seeing if they're an official guide or not. If they're an official guide, then uh, then absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. For sure. And Peter, you asked about the largest American or European expat communities. I mean, I would say Tangier and Marrakesh are two of the biggest ones. I mean, you've also got Rabat too. It kind of depends on if they're connected to like an academic setting, if they're more in the like diplomat setting, you know, kind of depends on like what the reason that particular expat is there for. Adil, do you have any additional input? Uh, I would say Marrakesh would have mostly uh, like a um, European uh, expats, uh, but when it comes to let's say administrative jobs, obviously the the all the embassies would be in Rabat, the capital. So there you'd find uh, larger you know communities of, of expats. Yeah, I connected with a group in Casablanca when I was there a couple of years ago. Yeah, Casablanca has also a lot of um, um, uh, American presence in there. Um, almost every person that I've met in America would tell me that um, they know somebody that were stationed in Casablanca back yeah. in the 60s. Or, you know, so at, uh, Casablanca, Tangier is a big one. I, I'm, I, I'm curious about a, a, one of the suburbs of Tangier. Uh, I traveled last time I traveled, I was in Tangier and then ventured down the coast to a town called Adila. Um, it's about Adila, yeah. 45 kilometers uh, west, south. And uh, I had a great time. I was on a tour with a, a man that I met uh, in person in Tangier who happened to be an attorney. And I was looking as a retired person, I'm looking to relocate on longer term basis for uh, three months or so. I've been in country twice. So for long tours, just like you've been talking about. That's fantastic. Um, thanks, Peter. Let's Thank see. Making sure. Elizabeth, you asked about special shots. If you go to cdc.gov and then go to the travel section, um, you can put in Morocco. It'll tell you what's recommended. You know, generally speaking, I think it'll be like HEP A and HEP B, kind of your standard shots. I don't think there's anything super special for Morocco that I can think of off the top of my head, but you can also make uh, an appointment, your local like hospital should have a travel clinic, so you can go make an appointment there um, in case you have any, you know, special particular needs that you want to address. Um, any, any other questions? No? All right. Well, um, definitely thank you so much for coming today. We're going to get this up. So in case you need to rewatch the recording, you can. We'll send um, some links for you and hope you can join us on another one. Thanks. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.